Okay, guys, this is beginning of section two on interpersonal violence. Um, this chapter um, is on the culture of violence. So we're going to go over the variability of culture and violence, the elements of culture, such as status, role, symbols, values, etc., um, the use of violence as entertainment, and then the process of socialization and how it interacts with violence. So the role of culture, um, cross-cultural analysis shows that societies manifest a wide variation in the prevalence, acceptance, and value that they place on violence. So how can you account for the differences in how violence is expressed? Um, this anthropologist concluded that the answer may be in the environmental stimulation or the culture of a social group rather than in its members genetics. So it is nurture, not nature. Um, culture is the curriculum by which we learn violence and it defines the context in which violence occurs. If you remember earlier, uh, the last lecture, we talked about context. So status and role. Um, culture and symbols, values, norms, traditions, they set the definition and the context of appropriate roles within those social institutions that we have. So these are the expectations for your place within that institution. For example, within the institution of education, your role as students is very different than my role as teacher. Um, it also defines the appropriateness of violence within those roles and inappropriateness of it outside of them. So police officers or soldiers, it's appropriate for them to use violence within their role as police officer or soldier, but if they were to take that violence outside of that role, such as if a police officer is at the bar drinking one night with his buddies and he's not a uniformed officer, but he decides to tase and beat somebody with a billy club anyway, that would not be appropriate. So culture and its learning are important areas to investigate when we look at violence, especially for how it influences the form that violence takes. So symbols, um, when we talked about uh, symbolic interaction, we talked about what symbols are and stuff like that. So the symbols of violence, um, you know, considering the symbols of violence is important. Symbols are cues to the perpetrator to commit violence. It can also be a proxy for intended violence or implied violence. So the closer the proxy resembles the act or potential effects of violent acts, the greater its power to elicit a violent reaction. So the stronger connection that we have between that symbol and violence and the act of violence, the more likely that symbol is to elicit violence. For example, you see a cross, oh, there's a cross. You see a burning cross, that is a very different symbol with a very different implication and it's very closely tied to acts of violence. These are some other symbols. Most of them are related to violence of some kind. 
Granted, some of them are legitimate and some of them are not. Um, but these are all symbols of groups which are involved in the commitment of violence. Um, so our culture and its value of violence, you know, we, the United States tends to really enjoy violence as entertainment. So social institutions within our culture prescribe roles of sanctioned violence and can promote violence as entertainment. So what kind of stuff are we talking about? Cockfighting, bear baiting as, you know, hunting is an entertainment, there's a sport, uh, gladiators, boxers, cage fighters, um, hockey, um, boxing, and then there's media violence, the, the movies, the TV, the music, the video games, um, all of these are entertainment, have entertainment value. Um, so they also offer the lesson of violence, which means that violence can achieve an end and at times can be necessary and a good thing. Um, some literature generally finds that media images are found to offer role models for antisocial behavior and give an unreal image of the world and violence. So the stuff, you know, I mean, obviously the stuff in media is pretty far from what we see in everyday life, but especially in the context of violence, they are offering a really skewed and far from real image of how the world works and violence. So, but overall the research is inconclusive on the effects of how they affect violent behavior. You know, I know that there's a lot of um, debate on, you know, the role of, you know, violent, uh, violent depictions in rap music or video games and, you know, oh, these cause, you know, school shootings and whatever. Um, there's really no research to back that up. Um, there's some that would argue that, you know, those statements are made in an attempt to um, control what people do put further limitations on um, media content. But as far as, you know, violent movies or violent video games causing violent behavior, um, it's kind of inconclusive. So, um, but then there's the problem of, you know, so many images. You know, the, the saturation. Um, that is potentially an issue. Um, outside of entertainment, um, humans have valued violence um, in the form of human sacrifice. Um, you know, back from the Aztecs, uh, Mesoamericans, um, you know, war was conquest and tribute. Um, but they also did human sacrifices to the point that the prisoners became the main purpose of the actions. So they stopped um, going out and, you know, conquering these other places for the sake of getting you know, like natural resources, they were going out and they were conquering these other areas and these other people for the purpose of collecting the people as a resource to use in human sacrifice. Um, so that's, that's different. Um, I don't know what other word to use for that. Um, 
So pre-Christian um, Scandinavians buried kids alive to stop plagues. Um, in Peru, um, kids were fat- sacrificed to quote unquote cure the emperor if he was sick or just to keep him healthy. You know, they killed kids just because they thought it would do something, um, whether he was sick or not, you know. Um, and there may be hundreds of Inca children sacrificed um, that they've found in graves on ice. Um, I think right now, I think the number has gone up since, since this data was out. Um, 115 sites that they found that have kids that were um, entombed in these uh, graves. Um, Religious martyrs, that's, you know, sacrifice. Um, Crusaders, jihadists, these are all um, people who believe that, you know, violence and, you know, human death is a sacrifice to a god. Um, there also was a time where um, women were sacrificed to their husbands. Um, this Hindu ritual of suti, um, when a man died, if he had a wife, which most of the time they did, um, she would be burned on the pyre of her husband. So they, you know, for those of you that don't know what a pyre is, it's a giant pile of wood and sticks and other flammable things. And they put the dead body on it and they burn it as like an outdoor cremation. Um, they would take the living wife and throw her into the fire with him. Um, you know, this isn't something that is unheard of. This is something that the Egyptians also did. And then there's sacrifice to the state. Um, this is sacrifice to your country. Um, kamikaze warriors. Um, these were the Japanese um, air fighters who would dive bomb um, boats and other planes um, with their with their planes um, knowing full well that you know the result was going to be their death um, but it was you know they were sacrificing their lives for their country um, and then war heroes I mean these are the same um, these, any soldier who dies in combat is sacrificing their life for the state. So changes in values, you know, is, is there a moment in narrowing the boundaries of acceptable, of what is acceptable in the areas of institutional violence? What about the coverage of violence in the news? Um, how have they depicted the wars that we've been in? Um, and how do those change the way that we view this violence? Um, the, you know, the end of the Vietnam War came as a result of the news media being open and showing images of real life combat and real life casualties and the American people decided we don't like the idea of killing women and children. And there was enough of a pushback that we had to pull out. Um, anybody that watches the news anymore I mean, there's countries where we're actively fighting that you probably don't even know about because we don't talk about it 
it's not on the news. There definitely aren't, you know, images like the ones that we're seeing here on these slides. You might see them in, you know, like a National Geographic story or some specific news outlet um, that's covering humanitarian issues. But for the most part, when you turn on the daily news, um, you're not going to see those types of images that we saw during Vietnam because it does change people's values and that's not necessarily what they want. Um, so has there been, you know, an increase in the concern about violence in movies? Um, they're definitely not making less violent movies. Um, but obviously you could see across the spectrum, there's quite a variety here. And what about sports? Is there anybody that's concerned about violence in sports? You know, not, not really. Um, this uh, researcher, Gellner, oh, excuse me, um, said that uh, agrarian society is doomed to violence. It stores valuable concentrations of wealth, which must be defended, and the distribution of which has been has to be enforced. During the agrarian age, most of mankind was not free and on the edge of starvation. We're still an agrarian-based economy. We've killed off most of the hunting and gathering societies. Um, the indigenous peoples of the Americas, many cultures in Africa and Asia, and all the hunter and gatherers of the world have suffered a holocaust because of industrialization for the most part. Um, culture and history uh, clearly prepare but do not completely determine how each generation of a society interprets its collective experience of violence. So there's a lot of influence there, but I mean, there's always things that can change. Um, the range of acceptance of violence um, is varied over time and place. Um, like I'd said earlier, the during the Vietnam War, the acceptance of that was um, very low following the images that came out. Today, um, I think the disconnect um, with the use of drones and stuff, not having actual people, um, you know, pull the trigger, so to speak, has allowed us to distance ourselves from those feelings. Um, but I digress. Um, just know that the range of acceptance varies. Um, any social science analysis must recognize the role of culture in prompting members to either receive instances of violence as normative and acceptable or deviant and not acceptable. So culture decides these things and how culture can change over time in how it interprets violence. Um, socialization. <clears throat> so the key to understanding how individuals deal with aggressive feelings and make sense out of the violence that they see and become involved in is socialization or learning. Um, that's all socialization is, is just learning things in society. Um, you don't have to be directly involved in violence to learn that it can be effective or rewarding and satisfying. And you, they can also come to regard it as destructive, painful, or horrifying, depending on the circumstances. Uh, social learning is often vicarious and indirect. You essentially watch another person who is either the perpetrator or the victim. You see the consequences of that action, and then you decide internally if that outcome, like, 
was effective or was it destructive? And you internalize that. And often you also internalize those techniques that you're seeing. Okay, so learning the role of the perpetrator. Um, anybody who's taken any psych classes, um, Bandura's study is Psych 101. Um, this was a lab experiment that demonstrated that kids, after being exposed to an adult acting aggressively and not being punished, will imitate that aggression. Um, they did this with uh, these little um, weighted punching bag dolls where, you know, an adult went in and, like, kicked the snot out of this little, like, inflatable clown thingy, and then the kids went in and just went nuts. Um, kids learning to imitate aggressive acts can take place whether there is immediate reward or punishment to the actor or the viewer. Um, I mean, obviously, if, they're, if they were rewarded or there was no punishment, the probability of the aggression went up. Adult male um, domestic violence. You know, this is how this ties in. This idea of generational transfer, i.e. social learning, of the physical and the verbal abuse within families as a way of either settling arguments or winning arguments. Um this is something where we're seeing the children view their parents or their, their grandparents having these arguments, you know, the, the fathers or the grandfathers using the physical or verbal abuse to settle these disagreements is learned through that observation and then when they are adults and they have families and they have a spouse and then they have those arguments they click back to this is what I've learned works I know how to do it from seeing this and that is what they do so it is this cycle that happens and that is known as generational transfer Um, Milgram, another Psych 101 um, experiment that was done on authority and conforming. So um, what they did was they had two guys um, or people. Um, one was the learner and the other one was um, the teacher. They would ask a series, the teacher would ask the learner a series of questions. If they got them wrong, they would administer an electric shock to the learner, ranging from low voltage all the way up to your dead voltage. Um, you know, obviously you couldn't really do that. There was no, um, nobody was really hooked up to it, but they didn't know that. Um, the learner was, you know, screaming and writhing in pain. The teacher thought that they were legitimately hurting this person. Um, anytime they were like, you know what, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. This is crazy. Somebody would come in in a lab coat and say, the experiment needs to continue. And that was all that they would say. And they have found that the, the presence of this person in the lab coat telling you, you need to keep going, was enough to cause the people to get up to really, really what would be dangerous levels of voltage um, if there had actually been somebody attached to it. And to the point where the person that was the teacher was physically ill, sweating, crying, very uncomfortable, but they kept going anyway. Um, I'm not sure exactly the number, but there were quite a few that made it all the way through the board, all the way up to the highest voltage. Um, 
and just absolutely physically sick with themselves. So social learning tells us that aggressive attitudes and violent techniques are learned, just like any other behavior. So relatives, friends, media people, actors, political leaders, um, and other people in authority all can be role models and teachers of violence. Um, Nuremberg, this is another one of those instances that, um, you know, I was just doing what I was told. Um, this, if you're not familiar, the Nuremberg defense or the Nuremberg principles, um, these were established following the end of World War II. Um, they were trying to think, uh, find um, a basis frame for the legal principles underlying the Nuremberg trials of the Nazi party members. You know, establishing what, what constitutes a war crime. And the defense was, you know, that I, we're just doing what we're told. Um, we're taking orders for our, from our superiors. Um, and then how does that vibe with, well, you have a moral responsibility as a human being to not engage in these acts. It doesn't matter who tells you. Um, we can also learn the role of the victim. All of us learn the cultural distinctions between people who are legitimate or illegitimate victims of violence. You know, these, these poor innocent victims, you know, they did nothing to deserve this. We, we hold empathy for their plight. Um, or there's those who are technically still victims, but we don't see as legitimate. And therefore, they don't deserve our sympathy. Um, you know, if you think about it in, um, in the context of, you know, the victims of the World Trade Center, you know, they were, you know, there was a, it's just like a bombing or any other, you know, act of terrorism versus the citizens of Afghanistan who've pretty much had the exact same thing done to them. One is legitimate. The other one is not. Um, abusive priests versus Harvey Weinstein. I mean, these... Um, Okay, sorry, the um, victims of abusive priests versus the victims of Harvey Weinstein. Um, as we've seen in a lot of media coverage um, here recently, there's been a lot of um, slut shaming, um, victim shaming for the women who've spoken out about, against Harvey Weinstein. Um, you don't see that in cases where priests are abusing children. Um, so the role of the victim is a culturally defined one. And those with vested interests may seek to restrict the definition. Um, learning the role of victim in lawsuits is an important example of learning the role of victim as it relates to forms of institutional violence. So learning the role of the audience. This is also something that we do. Um, learning to accept violence by being exposed to it regularly through the media. Um, by age 16, the average American kid will have been exposed to 50,000 attempted murders as well as approximately 200,000 acts of violence through the media. That is a lot. Um, Ordinary citizens are being conditioned by the media to expect more interpersonal violence um, that is than what is more that is what bleh, sorry. Okay. So the media is telling us that interpersonal violence is super prevalent and in reality the odds of that happening 
to us is relatively low. Um, they overestimate the, the rates of interpersonal violence in communities. Um, they condition us to think in terms of lurid interpersonal violence when the subject is brought up and to isolate violence as a phenomenon within this bizarre pathology rather than a product of the nature of our society. Which, when we talk more specifically about interpersonal violence, we'll talk about this a bit more in depth, but, um, you know, the, the rates of interpersonal violence um, are relatively low. Um, you know, the odds of walking down the street and being a victim of a stranger rape are extremely low, but that's what they always talk about in regards to, you know, community safety and stuff like that. Um, so that's something that we'll discuss later in more detail. Um, crime statistics as culture work in both creating our image of violence and violence. Um, this is the um, most recent one I was able to find um, from 2016, which, you know, it's a couple years old, but um, they don't put these out every year. Um, our culture, cultural understanding of crime is shaped by the agencies that collect and disperse data. So the government agencies play an important role in shaping what we perceive to be the reality of crime um, and what types of violence are likely to be portrayed. You know, what, what kind of statistics are they collecting? Um, they're collecting the ones that have that scare factor, I guess. Um, you know, a murder every 30 minutes and a rape every four minutes. And, you know, the, these types of things really, you know, get you to clutch your, your purse strings and um, allow for um, more laws, more restrictions um, to prevent these kind of things, which in actuality... Um, are not likely to happen as much as they would like you to think. So I know, like I said last time, we don't do dis discussion questions anymore, um, but it's some, like I said, food for thought, something to think about as you go through and you continue reading through these stuff, this material. Um, you know, what are the lessons of violence that are taught to us? by these authority figures and leaders and socializers and mass media um, are the lessons teaching us to use violence or to avoid violence. Um, next time you are watching a movie or listening to a song or, you know, watching a cartoon and you see violence, think about what is that teaching us about violence? So that's all I have for this section. Um, hopefully those of you who are doing interpersonal violence for your case study have already begun looking through the news media and um, stuff like that to find a topic. Um, I know everybody wants to do the, the great big um, crazy important, you know, crimes of the century. Um, I have found that the easiest ones to get, information on and the easiest ones to um, do and that are the most interesting are the ones that are closest to home. Um, you know, if there was a murder in your neighborhood or if there was a murder in your town or um, even in your state or, you know, wherever you're from back home, um, those local, that local news coverage is going to be really rich with information and it's going to be a lot easier for you to find good sources um, from the local papers and the local news media than it is to find something from like the New York Times um, 
So keep that in mind if you are looking for some sort of violence, you know, you might want to start looking at the local level. Um, or if you know where the victim was from or where the perpetrator was from, checking those local news sources online and seeing if you can find something written by local people. Um, they're going to give you a lot more background on the perpetrator, a lot more background on the victim and their relationship with each other and other details that are going to be really important for you to write your case study comparison. Um, then the broader news topics that are just going to say, oh, well, you know, it was this woman who was attacked and that was pretty much it. Um, so keep that in mind. Again, if you have questions, please post them to the discussion board. Um, have a great day.